Hello everyone and welcome to howtoworldconquest.mp4. This is going to be a condensed version of the Ryukyu World Conquest that I achieved earlier in the year. Uh, the whole thing is available on YouTube, however as I can imagine 60 hours of viewing material might be a bit much for uh, a few of you. So this is going to be a shortened version. It's going to show uh, most of the important points and the tricks used within the Three Mountains achievement run. Uh, right from the start I'll tell you it was successful uh, but this video is going to be full of spoilers so if you if you think you can iron man the whole video set then be my guest otherwise uh, stay glued to your screens folks now uh, I had a, an unsuccessful run before the, the run that actually worked where Japan united very quickly and kicked my ass also when I arrived in Europe uh, everyone out teched me and beat me senseless so after that, I sat and thought for a while, uh, dug up a few tricks, and tried again. I set up a few save files so that if things went south, I could load up another save very quickly and bounce right back into it. The thing about these three save files that I'd set up was that I used a mission exploit so that I could start the game with 100 army tradition, 100 prestige, and a god tier general. And uh, as of time of recording, this mission exploit still works. Uh, basically, you recruit your entire manpower pool, and you get the uh, the mission to recover your manpower reserves. And you recover them by just cancelling the troops. Then you do exactly the same thing and take the accumulate money mission. You uh, again, you cancel your troops. It says you accumulated the money. It gives you prestige, and that enables the. Uh, in get your manpower recovery back, so... The uh, the rewards for that are prestige and army tradition, and the better your army tradition, the better your general. So, uh, because of that, I was able to get a god-tier general that well and truly kicked the entire run off to a great start. Uh, our king there was called... Uh, not our king, or rather, our general was Ko, or K-O, and he certainly did knock out everybody he came across. Our first victims, so to speak, were Champa. Uh, diplomatically isolated, religiously isolated. They are the uh, one of the most one of the most ideal people for you to bully in Southeast Asia if you're wanting to expand as Ryukyu. So I got myself a big old army, as many as I could afford, and I went and crushed Champa. Now, to be honest, this cost me a lot more uh, men than I had wanted to spend fighting him. Some bad rolls and crossing penalties and uh, everything else worked against me, but uh, we, we still defeated them, carpeted them. Still I was uh, I was feeling a bit sketchy after losing all those men, but uh, a miracle came down. We well and truly got a miracle during this time in the way of our heir. Uh, I pretty much jumped for joy when Shitatsu Sho gave out Shitsu a 5-3-3, and I thought this was going to be the run. So uh, we ran with our uh, not ideal starter on Champa, and uh, we went to see how it would go along. So Champa got gobbled up in one shot, they got full annexed. Expensive though it was on our diplomatic points and a wee bit of aggressive expansion, we, uh, we did it. Uh, rather than just vassalizing them, because by annexing them we were able to forge a claim on Lang Shang. And using that claim we went to war with them just after we released uh, Champa, who is now Animist. They were previously Hindu, they are now spat out as an animist. So, uh, war with Lang Shang, it was really sketchy. We didn't have much money, our manpower was so-so, uh, but we were pretty much relying on this god general that we had cheesed ourselves at the very start of the game. Now, Lang Shang brought in a couple of friends, and we were hilariously outnumbered. And, uh, to be honest, the starting battles, I really didn't think they were going to go my way. Uh, they invaded the Champa lands. At the very least, I knew my homeland would be uh, relatively safe. But we got Champa to attach to us, and we just put all our faith in the dice, and our faith really paid off. The thing about having maximum prestige and maximum army tradition is that your morale is sky high. And the higher your morale, the more morale damage you do. So even when the enemy thought they had the advantage and attacked into us, our general KO, he really took them out. And uh, as we were able to rout their armies, it uh, made carpeting them all that much easier. And as we carpeted them, 
we were certain to loot as we go along. When you march into a province, you can take its base tax value in uh, loot straight to your coffers. So the uh, the death of the Langshang army really worked wonders for us. Pegu decided they would try to attack us navally, but we got a, a rebel pop-up, which uh, got in their way. Rebels on our uh, capital allowed us to collapse, and every time we collapsed, we reset our uh, stability back to zero and our war exhaustion to zero. This was really handy, and it didn't really have any ill effects on us. So with Langshang vassalized, and we spat out Khmer as a vassal as well, noting that they're all animist, was happy enough. But uh, for some reason, Langshang kept their aggressive expansion with us. We were uh, we wanted to figure out more about that later. So we took the fight to Ayuta. We'd originally wanted to ally them. But uh, they grew too powerful too quickly and weren't interested in our alliance. And anybody that uh, won't side with me, well, they die for me. We gave as much land to our animist vassal Khmer as possible. And we're just really trying to build up a power base of vassals here in Southeast Asia. We really can't take much land for ourselves. We could core it, but it would be uh, terribly revolting. I uh, don't want to deal with all the peasant uprisings and nationalists and uh, patriots. So, vassalization really was the way to go in uh, Southeast Asia. So, Ayuta fell to our might, and what we did was we allowed Khmer to occupy lands themselves so that they would pay the dip cost and everything else, and uh, there would be no ill effects from that. We wouldn't have to sell it on, and we wouldn't have to pay the dip cost to return cores, even though it would make them like us quite a bit better. So uh, this really gave us the power that we needed in Southeast Asia, and as we bided our time, we were able to unlock the colonization ideas. Now, Taiwan is pretty much the ideal colony in the world. It produces uh, exotic goods, usually chinaware or tea. And uh, with that, we're able to uh, expand our power with actual cored provinces of our religion and our culture, bearing in mind that we are animist. Uh, some would say the worst religion in the world, but certainly more on that later. I couldn't be de dealing with uh, any native uprisings, so we decided to put them to sword as quickly as possible. Natives slow down the speed at which you colonize, so I was keen to get rid of those as quickly as I could. Uh, expensive on our manpower as it was, and uh, in this run, money really was an issue for a while, because, well, we don't have much income, and you can't... Uh, can't build an army out of just men, we need money to fund them. So one trick we did whilst exploring was I set a ship to have an explorer and then I would patrol back and forth between sea zones. Every time you enter a sea zone there's a chance that you'll discover new provinces that are under terra incognita. So we just patrolled back and forth over them to discover them and we uh, made our way to colonizing these lands. Back in this patch these lands in the Spice Islands were not tropical, so there were no malices to uh, take them over. Make hay while the sun shines, as long as we had our explorer. We sailed over to Europe to try and figure out what was going on there. Um, basically, we wanted to know as much about Europe as possible. We were actually seeking out one province miners that are in the Western Tech group. And that's all part of uh, a pretty good plan. Uh, we actually dismissed some of our men earlier there, thinking we can save some money. But uh, just as we're discovering Ireland, Dai Viet decides they would fancy their chances. They launch a coalition war on us, and uh, they do it just when we can't get Ake as a vassal, as a, an ally. In fact, they caught us out just by a month or two there. So uh, Dai Viet declared and brought in quite a few big friends. So we tech up as best we can. Uh, we consolidate our units into one good fighting stack, and uh, we try to weather the storm. It looks really bad right from the start, however, as we go down south, we roll ourselves a God King General. That's six shock on Eki Sho, and he single handedly turns that war around. And uh, Dai Viet becomes a vassal for all their struggles. What a pity. What a pity. Certainly happy to uh, to have won that. That could have been a, a very early wipe for us in the game. But we get back to the matter at hand, which was dealing with Europe. We shipped over as many men as we could and declared war on the Knights. Now, they are a uh, one province miner in the Western Tech group, thank goodness. And when we uh, occupy them, it takes a while because they have one hell of a fort there. 
we uh, we demand that we become their protectorate. So uh, the chat went wild then. That was uh, that was quite fun, quite the turnaround. So yeah, we become their protectorate, and we get quite a few bonuses from that. It says they won't want to do it, but we get the green tick at the bottom right because we have a hundred percent war score. That's uh, that's a trick for a while if you want to enforce uh, demands upon you in the war that you're winning. So uh, as a protectorate. We can still declare our own wars. We lose all our vassals the moment we become a protector, so Diviate is now free, but we can make more vassals by taking land and uh, releasing it. We get a 20% tech bonus on everything, and this is really huge. It's going to allow us to uh, rocket past our fellow Asians when it comes to technology, especially military technology. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing is, as a protectorate, we are immune to coalitions. And we are going to be putting everyone around us to sword, knowing that we are immune to coalitions. Coalitions really are the bureaucratic brick wall in this game, and I'm always searching for ways to get around it. Becoming a protectorate was uh, really the best option. There are very few downsides. You only have a few diplomatic actions that you can't take. Off the top of my head, I think uh, you can't. Uh, is it you can't ally? Can't guarantee. There are a few things, but they are minor compared to the fact that you are immune to coalitions. So straight away we're putting Diviate to the sword, our ex-vassal. And um, what we're trying to do now is balance out our land religiously for a trick that we're setting up here. And uh, it was it was pretty difficult balancing things out. I had to do a few obscure wars here, uh, taking the correct base tax worth of heathen land off of Ayuta and Diviate, and painfully having to core it. At monarch points, I am very miserly with them. But even so, we break truce on Diviate just because I need certain lands for this trick that we are setting up here. Now, the colonization process is going wonderfully, and we finally unlock Achieve Religious Unity. And we can fulfill that simply by starting another colony. The rewards for Achieving Religious Unity are 25 admin points and 25 dip points. As you can imagine, this is... Uh, a pretty good prize to get. This was patched out very quickly uh, after I did this stream, so thank you Paradox for that, but it wasn't soon enough that I couldn't exploit it for all it is worth. So basically I would have my religious unity balancing on a knife edge uh, with humanist ideas. Humanist ideas gives you plus 25% religious unity off the top of my head, so I would balance it out about 75% so that with the plus 25%, we're just below 100%. I would then start the colony, it would boost me over 100% religious unity, and I would complete the mission. I would then take another garbage mission, like uh, recovering our manpower, or accumulating money, and I would just do this again and again. Uh, I believe it was every five or six days, I would get 25 admin and 25 diplo points. Now, uh... Monarch points are one of the rarest things in the game, so you definitely want lots of them. Using this, we could really uh, turbo along with our tech, get our admin and dip tech as high as need be, and flesh out all the ideas we needed. And uh, speaking of ideas, I believe we went uh, exploration and humanism, and religious after that? I'm pretty sure we went religious after that. It's been a wee while. But yeah, with... Uh, we couldn't do this all the time. It was very difficult to balance the religious unity all the time because as you take more land, your religious unity will get shuffled about. And when I got a little dry on admin and dip points, I would have to target provinces such that they would bring me back to religious unity of just under 100% so that uh, getting another colony would boost it over 100% for the mission. Now, uh, Early game it wasn't so hard, in the late game getting that one colony would only boost my religious unity by a fraction of a percent, something like less than 0.05 of a percent. Uh, so it was very important to keep good tracks of what my religious unity is at. Thankfully uh, 270 and a few others worked together to make an Excel spreadsheet. For calculating religious unity, this was extremely useful for me throughout the entire campaign, and I uh, pretty much had it open next to me from the moment that I had it, trying to balance my conquests around that, and if that wouldn't work, I would have to convert land or give it to vassals, 
just so I could stay around the 100% religious unity. But uh, with that exploit done, now that we are immune to coalitions, and with practically unlimited admin and dip points, we go on a rampage, and we consume Asia like Asia has never been consumed before. Shan is demolished, Pegu becomes a vassal, Orissa is put to sword, Jampure is also put to sword, and we are eyeing up Vijianagar. But during this, I got an event, Monopoly Company Formed. Normally gives you a wee bonus to trading, or a lump sum of cash. But uh, I was at war with Jampure at the time, so I demanded that Jampure gave me their entire treasury of 150 something ducats. Now, that event would normally give me around 500 ducats, because it's based on your projected yearly income. But after the turn of the month, the game thought, hmm, he made 150 ducats in war reparations. So, obviously, in a year, he's going to make 12 times that. And because this event bases the money that it gives you off of your projected yearly income, it skyrockets from 500 ducats to 3,300 ducats. We take that, we invest in infrastructure for our country, and it uh, really speeds up the rate at which we can demolish India. That money really... Uh, it really did change the course at this point, because I was having to be very miserly with my cash. Frankly, that event is a bit broken. I am, however, checking out the uh, relations that my vassals have with me. Jampure kept their aggressive expansion with me, while, whereas most vassals did not. Uh, I later discovered that this is because of the order in which nations have uh, opinion pros and cons towards you, and basically you want to get aggressive expansion with them early, then stack a bunch of other modifiers on it before you annex and release them. Uh, thankfully we found this out in time before we started making some bigger, more important vassals, such as Vigianagar here, who we've finally started putting to sword. Uh, they are uh, not too difficult to slay, because our technology is going up, thanks to being a protector with that 20% bonus. Uh, the difficult thing really is balancing out our conquest here, in that our troops can't be everywhere at once. And meanwhile, we're also trying to colonize as best we can. It really was uh, a nightmare for someone who's not so good at multitasking, such as myself. Nonetheless, we rip Vigianagar to bits, and as you can see, we're getting quite a few rebels and rebel pop-ups. All that land we're taking is not cored and will not be cored. We're just taking all the rebels on the chin, the nationalism, the prestige hits, we're just going to have to deal with them. It took several wars with Vigianagar to rip them down into nothingness. And the greatest threat in all of that became dancing around rebels who would just pop up and murder me. Like so. Nonetheless, Vigianagar did fall. We got rid of most of the rebels by giving in to demands and then spat Vigianagar back out. They are now animist. They somewhat like us, but they have religious ideas, so they should be converting that petty Hindu land as best they can. Notice that their technology is pretty high. They get all the they get my tech levels when I spit them out. And uh, that's going to make them a pretty good vassal for me, once they get their uh, rebel problems dealt with. I give Ming similar treatment, ripping them apart, and uh, they fell even easier. But then Ming is always someone that's really easy to destroy. It is a shame, but uh, China goes down a treat. We rip them apart into their, uh, their smaller break-off countries, Shun and Zhou, and they get snaffled up quite easily. So with the collective power of China and India under us, we are able to uh, keep going even faster. Now China is worth a lot of money when it's not controlled by Ming, so uh, we're going to put it to good use. It's also in our culture group, however when I absorbed the land, I found that some of the provinces had permanent minimum revolt risk due to a bug of integrating countries that have uh, foreign support for rebels, but couldn't let it slow me down, I must march westward. Europe needs to know the glory of Ryukyu and the glory of animism, bearing in mind that during this run I decided that I would always stay animist and I would not westernize. Um, sounds like a bit of a handicap, but we're able to make the most of it. Persia, legendary though they are, they get chewed up easily enough. Now, the final trick, or at least the final main trick here, is this Muslim Influences event. Now, if you're a pagan and you border someone who is Sunni, 
Shiite, Catholic, Protestant, or Buddhist with high relations with you, you'll get this event popping up, which will either convert a random province or increase your stability by one. And uh, back during this patch, you could chain that mission again and again. The more animist provinces you have, the more likely it is to pop up. And it got to the point where that event was a nuisance, it kept popping up all the time. Nonetheless, it kept me tapped out at positive three stability for almost the entire campaign. Pegu was our first such vassal. We spat them out animist, but they collapsed to Buddhist rebels, so they became Buddhist influences. I believe Korzan was our Muslim influences, and later on we would even find ourselves with some Christian influences. So uh, the more different religions you have of those five, the more often it's going to fire. Uh, lucky us, I suppose. So uh, Asia's looking pretty under wraps for Ryukyu. We keep a few countries around in case we need to declare war on them for general purposes of being at war. It can come in handy. But uh, now we have to set our sights on uh, bigger prey. The Ottomans have got to die, and whilst they put up a great fight, as the Ottomans often do, their one weakness, that straight, <laughs> really helped us cripple them. That and our uh, enormous might, but uh, putting that aside. The Ottomans got carved up in a similar way to Vigianagar. We just tore them to shreds, and we would break truce, attack, take as much land as possible, break truce, take as much land as possible, until there was nothing left of them. We vassalized the Mamluks as well and fed them some land, but uh, to be honest, I don't think that was the best course of action. I probably should have just taken only the Ottomans. Still, it's what we did, and uh, I'm ever so glad we did, because spitting out the Ottomans gives you a terrific vassal. And again, we spit him out as an animist. I don't think he converts much land, but the Ottomans have good tolerance of heathens, so it's not like they get many revolts. And again, they do not keep the aggressive expansion malice towards us. And we also spick them out as a noble republic. We had earlier collapsed to rebels that forced us into glorious republicanism. Uh, to take a break from all the mayhem of conquest, we colonize Australia, and uh, we call it Shitatsu Show's Holiday Home, just for a bit of comic relief, because uh, this run was really draining. It took a hell of a lot of time, and it was nice to get a few laughs in there. Speaking of laughs, crushing Japan, always fun, bearing in mind that Japan is in my, well, it is my culture group, they're Japanese, so we're able to take that land without too much fuss. This is the Excel spreadsheet I mentioned earlier, the one that we use to calculate religious unity, and I'm having a hard time of getting my religious unity balance just below 100%, so I fiddle around with it and try to figure out how much land do I have to convert, or colonize, or remove from my country, just to get myself within that threshold. Uh, this was back when tolerance of uh, religions didn't count towards your religious unity. It was either uh, it was either tolerated or not. So I wanted animist provinces to really balance the thing out. Otherwise, I would have to convert them or sell them off to vassals. So uh, the world is looking pretty good for us right now. <laughs> Japan down and. Asia looking really under wraps, even the Ottomans are part of us. Which means Europe now has to die. Our first targets are Poland and Lithuania. They put up a half decent fight, but frankly, it wasn't enough. We chew them up and we spit them out. They are animist, as they should be. And that really paves the way open for the rest of Europe. Uh, which, to be honest, I was far too overconfident about. When I reached the HRE, they stonewalled me. This fight is a great example of that. Um, I might have, I might be the top dog in Asia. When it comes to fighting in Germany, bearing in mind I am still uh, glorious Chinese technology, we get floored by Habsburgs and co, even with the combined might of our vassals in Europe. So although we do make some gains, Hungary, for example, became our vassal, um, the Habsburgs were having none of us. They slaughtered our troops there, and despite our size, we were actually hurting for manpower during these wars. So, uh, yeah, it didn't go so hot there. This battle really captures what it was like for me fighting in Europe. I wasn't even playing at my best there, though. I watched my videos after I'd played it and just thought, I have done really badly here. So, uh, I run away from Europe, I lick my wounds, and I go, okay, 
let's get some more meat on our side. We want the Russian bear to help us with these attacks in Europe. So what we do is we fight Russia. And boy, do we fight Russia. Yeah, they say never fight Russia in winter. Well, we had to fight him all year round for decades, I believe. We were at war with Russia for a long time. He managed to get a few allies during that time, and we uh, tried our best to put them to sword. Bavaria, man, I had a lot of hard times with Bavaria. But eventually, they too would fall to us, albeit barely. I think Castile got involved as well, but the main target here was Russia. We wanted to do unto them as we did to Poland, Lithuania, Ottomans, and Vigianagar. Trouble is, Russia was the largest one by far that we had to do this to. We broke truce somewhere in the region of 10 times, and this went over the course of uh, several sessions. It took a long time, but we were methodical. We uh, occupied all the land that we could, bearing in mind we would have to 100% these guys in the end. We split them off from their Siberian land to make it all overseas, so it would be cheaper to take on the peace table. And I think I'm actually getting... Um, administrative efficiency at this point, allowing me to take even more land. Still, Russia is huge. I was in no position to stop them from growing early on. But we do uh, do the best we can, and Russia, well, they certainly do get eaten up. Piece by piece by piece. Releasing the guy, giving them land, just to, uh, just to make it slightly less of a burden on me, because I would have to fight all these rebels that popped up or give in to their demands. Still, Russia was dismantled, taken over to our side, and we used their might to crush Europe. The very same Europe that ejected us so easily, we turned around and we stomped them into jelly. I remember having a lot of troubles thinking what to do to Munster, but in the end, we dismantled the HRE. France became its final emperor, but uh, once we had Ile de Frogs, we were able to remove the empire from the equation. All of Germany got annexed and spat out as vassals. Bearing in mind that as a protectorate we can't actually force people to be vassals on the peace table, we have to consume them and release them. I keep a few European provinces cored for myself, so that I can uh, basically have them to run away to, and core other lands, because it's another continent to my home one, and I would need those for coring if there's any lands that I couldn't just spit out. Even the Irish were not lucky to escape us in South America. France put up one hell of a fight. All their lands are very rich, so it took a long time to siege them out and take it all to peace table. Their national ideas make sieging them hell. I think they had a march on top of that. But, like all countries before them, France did fall, and the world was looking greener and greener, but the timer was really running out, and I was starting to feel the pressure. At this point, I still had to deal with uh, the Swedes, the British, Iberia, and the last remnants of France. The remnants of France who had ran away to Scotland of all places, and boy did they take their armies with them. Um, with our cunning though, we made our own beachhead on the Western Isles. We were able to certainly outdo them when it comes to the navy, uh, but we goaded them into fighting us in the hills of the Highlands, and uh, well, we fought for our freedoms. It was one hell of a fight. I honestly thought we were going to lose, but uh, for, never underestimate <coughs> the spirit of Ryukians. We're having to give in to rebel demand, so our, our prestige is pretty tanked, and that is really hurting our morale. But our superiority in every other way really, uh, really shined in Scotland. We put France well and truly to the sword and kicked them out as best we could. We had to chase them down through Scotland with very little morale and our numbers really dwindling. But we caught them in Aberdeen, my very own birthplace, that eliminated the last of the French armies. And we spread out with armies so small it couldn't even be represented on the map. We chewed them up completely and then we spat them out. It felt really good. Now we had France on our side for our dealings with the rest of the world. And France, even when they're, uh, they're animist like this, they are mighty, and they certainly make our diplomatic map mode look even better for the world. When we annexed France, and it's very important that we did annex them, we got control of their colonies. That would help in the New World, <laughs> along with all our other battles. Next up, though, was Castile, and Castile had uh, quite the global empire. They fought us out of Africa really well. In fact, I'm sure they put a few stack wipes on us. 
but we wiped them in a similar fashion off the map. Took them down to Toledo, taking every other province possible, and again, it was important to annex them, because in doing so, we gained control of all of their overseas colonies. Uh, again, we just spat them out, because we can't be dealing with all that rebellious land, but as long as we had lands like Castilian La Plata and Florida on our side, the battles in the New World would go a lot more smoothly against the likes of Great Britain. Great Britain, such an underperformer. We put them to sword and took all of their land, and again, their colonial nations. It, uh, it wasn't much. What was much was how the Portuguese beat us off their islands without even batting an eye. It was, uh, it was heavy going, trying to get the likes of Madeira and Azores, but uh, we eventually got them after some really appalling battles. Now, bearing in mind it is 1813 here, and I am getting whipped by Portugal, one of the last countries alive. I was uh, really starting to feel the pressure, but they felt the pressure when we sieged them out of existence. Portugal is now the last country left on Earth. I siege the last province, and I wonder, why have I only got 99% war score? Bearing in mind, I need a full 100 for the annex. So, Portugal have a province, either owned or occupied by them, somewhere in the world, and I have no idea where it is. I am sweating bullets here, it is 1815. Where is this last province I need to annex Portugal? My country is covered in rebels, war exhaustion up the arse, and yeah, I'm panicking pretty bad. Everyone telling me to check the Andamans, everyone telling me to check various places, I'm fairly certain I've checked all the terra incognita, but I have no idea where this last Portuguese province is, and this is the last province I need for world conquest, complete world conquest, as Ryukyu. So, where could it be? Where the hell could it be? I'm checking the New World, because I think maybe his colonies have occupied something in Portugal's name. That would prevent a full annex. It's certainly a good trick if you're playing as someone who's about to be annexed. Just occupy somewhere. And uh, I just, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> look, at, look at my war exhaustion going sky high, and uh, I need out of this war right now. So I comb over the world. I get very suspicious about the Terra Incognita, although I'm fairly certain there are no islands there. I check around, I look for all these small islands that I hate, and then we find it. Shitatsu shows holiday home full of senile old people, and they couldn't keep control of New Zealand. Part of it defected to Portugal, so I summoned every cannon that I could, sent them over there, and I took those provinces with great elation. As it fell, we got 100% on Portugal, the last independent nation in the world, other than yours truly. And yes, with great elation, I hit that full annex button, and on this day, the entire world fell to the might of the Three Mountains. Reiki reigned supreme. But during this run, I said I would try to get full, full world conquest at Ryukyu, but I promised that I would convert Rome to animism. So, uh, although, although I'm very glad, and I make sure I check that every country is my vassal or myself, I checked it very meticulously, I, uh, I wanted to set about turning Rome uh, into an animist province and an animist country. So I pick a totemist uh, country in North America. I give them Rome. I take their only province from the Americas, so now their only province is Rome. And then I, uh, I attack them with a religious CB, and I force convert them to animism. What this does is it force converts the uh, it force converts the capital of their uh, of their country, if they are heretical to you. And since their capital is Rome, it force converts Rome, ignoring all the penalties to it. I then go about the Papal States and check them out. Your very own animist Papal States owning Roma. It certainly is a glory to behold. So there we go, the Three Mountains achievement as Reiki, done on patch 1.7. Obviously there have been patches since then, but if you want to emulate any of this, be my guest. It uh, should all work. That's how it all went down and uh, thank you for checking this condensed version of it. Have a wonderful day.